You're listening to Trek FM. Want to join in the conversation and share your thoughts on this episode? Join the Babel Conference, our listeners discussion group on Facebook. Just type B-A-B-E-L into the Facebook search field and we'll look forward to seeing you there. This is Steve Sansweet of Rancho Obi-Wan and you're listening to the 602 Club. Welcome to TFM's local watering hole, and I am just one of your hosts here, Matthew Rushing, and excited, as always, to have Christy Morris here with me. Yes, I am here. Uh, I've balanced my chi in preparation, and uh, I'm, I'm not going to hide it anymore. That's good. That's good. I got my feng shui going on in my room, you know, just to be ready for this yeah. podcast. So, yeah, <laughs> really excited uh, as we're going to dive into... Uh, something that uh, kind of got released, and we'll talk about it a little bit later. But we're talking about Mulan tonight, and so the the new live action film from Disney that is on Disney Plus now for everyone for free, no premium prices anymore Yay. for that. So now you can check it out. But before we get there, of course, don't forget to follow us wherever uh, you get your podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, all of these places. Make sure you check us out. Uh, give us a star rating and review over on Apple Podcasts. And, of course, make sure you're subscribed so you get the show as soon as it drops. You can find us on Twitter at The 602 Club. And, of course, we're on Instagram over at The 602 Club TFM. Uh, please follow us there. Um, we love interacting with people over there on both places. You can find us online, uh, of course, at trek.fm. You can send us an email at trek.fm slash contact. We're on Facebook at facebook.com slash trek.fm. And, of course, we've got the listeners-only discussion group there, the Babel Conference. You can join and talk to listeners from all over the world. And last but not least, want to say a huge thank you to our associate producers, Ken Tripp, Davis Grayson, Ryan Millett, Daniel Noah. Thank you so much, guys, for supporting the network here through Patreon. And, you know, as we round down the year and we look towards next year, we could definitely use your help. Uh, it costs a lot of money to put this network together and do it ad-free. So uh, if you like that and you like what we do, please support us over on Patreon at patreon.com slash trackfm. So, uh, Christy, so... It, I mean, I'm sh- I don't even have to ask this question because I know we both love the original Mulan, um, mm-hmm. and so I really, you know, obviously there's lots of places I think we can compare this, but you know, the live action movies aren't necessarily meant to just be like straight up remakes, as a lot of them kind of have been in many ways, uh, and so this movie does take a, a different approach, like it it really is trying to be its own thing, um, and so. And in fact, you know, I, I I know you had and I did. I went back and kind of read the Ballad of Mulan that this is all based on, which I had mm-hmm. no idea. I'd never done that before. There's not a lot there. Like, both movies literally add everything <laughs> to it other than this very basic structure. Um, I right. mean, it's, it's a very simple, simple ballad. Um, there's not a lot to it other than this girl fights for her dad, comes back, and in fact, the thing that's most different in the ballad from everything else that we've seen, at least on screen, is that they don't know that she's a woman until she gets home from the battle. Like, there's no reveal right. in the middle. So they've definitely changed all that to make it more exciting and everything. So this movie definitely trying to do its own thing, and one of the things that it does is adds this idea of, like, harnessing chi, it adds the idea of chi to the movie. Um, and so I wanted to talk about that with you because it's a really big part of this film. Like they literally start the movie with this idea of Mulan and, and having um, Chi and, and trying to really build this into what this version of the story is going to be like. Yeah. So I ac- actually Chi as a concept is a Chinese idea mm-hmm. and it has a lot of different meanings, but the main one has been that it's about your sort of like how Star Wars fans, you know, identify with the force, um, that your Chi is like your life force mm-hmm. and that to say you have a balanced Chi is also the practice of Qigong, which people have probably heard of before. So, so it is honoring its Chinese roots of the story to add that to it. 
Um, so I really didn't have a problem with that. And it's a way to um, make it more interesting as to how Mulan has this power that makes her a little bit more um, courageous than necessarily other women in her village. Yeah, and it's interesting. So, like, the movie defines chi. Uh, it says that, you know, it it's the boundless energy of life. So, kind of like the Force in the sense that it's mm-hmm. made by all living things. Uh, which you can understand where the Force kind of comes from in his idea. Uh, the, the movie also says, you know, it's something that everybody's born with. But it is reserved for warriors to use. It's forbidden to use destructively. And it cannot be fully harnessed... Uh, or achieved if someone is lacking one of the three v- virtues, whether it's loyalty, bravery, or truth, which I don't have a problem with in concept. But one of the things I, I really had an issue with was, one, I feel like they never really define enough parameters for what the movie is meaning as chi um, mm-hmm. to make sense of the things that we see people use chi with like we see the warriors being able to do really cool things i mean it it is a cool idea that it helps explain why um these warriors can basically do the crouching tiger hidden dragon style of fighting you know where they can run up sides of walls and all these kind of things which great i love all that um Mm -hmm. but where it gets like really weird to me is i don't understand so like with women, does does their chi allow them to do things that it doesn't allow men to do? And um, they call them witches, basically, if they use their chi, because then we see the witch. You know, she's able to turn into mm-hmm. uh, a hawk. She's able to basically take the form of other people. Like, mm-hmm. there's all of these weird things that it allows you to do, but I don't understand exactly why... The, I mean, are they just trying to say this is only something that women are able to do, or is this something that anybody can do who can really harness their chi? And I don't, I don't get it. Yeah, that's the biggest problem that I had with the whole movie was those two things was not the idea of putting chi in the movie, um, but how they don't explain it and how they kind of use it against themselves by trying to make a movie about a strong woman who can do anything as good as a man on her own or even better. um, But then making it like women specifically are supposed to hide their chi or can't use it as well as a man or shouldn't or whatever that defeats the purpose of having a strong woman. (laughs) Um, And then also kind of goes back to that um, ideal of real Chinese culture before, which we've all heard of where, you know, that women were always lesser than and that people didn't desire to have girl babies um, so I think that they need to, if they're, if they're going to do a, a remake of Mulan or any kind of movie talking about Chinese culture, that they need to try and get away from that. Um, so yeah, I think that aspect of the chi didn't work in their favor. And then I think to having witches at all and having, uh, like shape shifting shouldn't have been in the movie. Yeah. And I, see, that's where it's like, I don't mind that that's an idea because the, the, you know, uh, uh, obviously it taking the we're we're taking the fantasy element you know you know, and that yeah. idea like this is a, this is a legend you know and so those type of mm-hmm. we, we're so used to those type of stories obviously um and you know having fairy godmothers and all that kind of stuff it's not weird right but the the, the the thing about it was is that so much of this movie wants to be grounded and more realistic And then you kind of add this like magical idea of chi and it allows people to basically do magical things that don't necessarily like comport with the idea of chi allowing somebody if they're completely centered as a person to be able to do extraordinary things. Extraordinary things are different than magical things. And so it's like. There isn't enough definition in the film to really, I feel like, make this make sense. And I think you nailed that when you said, like, I feel like this muddles the message of the story. It's not as clean Mm -hmm. that, like, the original Mulan, the message is, is that 
women are not just good for marriage. They can bring honor right. to their family in other ways other than just marriage, and Mulan proves that. And that's what makes Mulan special is she's willing to do that. Like, she, in gosh, for the story, it kind of feels like, you know, she's the one who's willing to stand up and do what's right. And she's doing it for her family. She's doing it because she's trying to save her father. Uh, but she's also doing it because she knows, you know, um, if she doesn't, her dad will die. But th- this makes Mulan feel special in a whole other way that kind of divorces f- her from an empowering message for all women. Because, like, again, mm-hmm. it's not clear enough in the movie, like, we know all people are born with chi, but it's only for warriors. And like, do women have chi and they just never tried to access it before? And, and is that what makes Mulan special? And it's just, it yeah. it really muddles the story for Mulan herself as a character that was, I thought, I felt like, and my wife just complained about this as well because we talked about it. Um, I remember even after the first time we watched the movie, which was just... It it just doesn't make it as clean um, and neat mm-hmm. when it comes to the story of w- women are more than just baby makers. Exactly. And, you know, it really, too, it, it first got me and, you know, made me upset when they're even showing how Mulan is using it. When they do that new intro scene of her as a little girl instead of starting off from her as a young woman. The way that they filmed the little girl's stunts, and then you'll see it again, that same filming style of the action for, you know, either the kicks or jumping up high in the air or whatever, doing extraordinary things. A little girl, unless she has magic powers, is not going to be able to jump down from the roof of this giant facade you know, the the way that she was able to grab the spear and save herself from falling and everything, it just didn't feel right. Right. And it, exactly what you're saying, it didn't fit with what made Mulan such a strong character in the first place. She doesn't need magic powers. She had everything she needed before. Right. Well, and, and as Mulan as a character, Mulan, it, it's not as though Mulan herself was somebody who above wanting to fall in love and have a family, right. and all of those things, you know, that that wasn't the point of the story, you know, the, the point of the story uh, was the fact that she is worried about her father, not that she's not getting to be everything she's meant to be, you know, there right. there is a side of that, which is that Mulan has more to offer than just that, but it doesn't mean she rejects that either, and, you know, that we see mm-hmm. that even in this movie, she's she's not here to reject being a woman, she just wants to have more doors open for her. But again, it's like this movie almost makes it special that it's just Mulan who should have those doors open for her. And it's not clear that like maybe more women, you know, because Mulan and this witch mm-hmm. specifically happen to be these characters to which have this immense power through Chi. And again, it's like it's just not really clear as to why they have such over immense power because there's no there's no like prologue that talks about like the idea of chi or there's nothing really that gives us an like I listed everything that the movie gives you about mm-hmm. what it says about chi that's just not enough to to make it make sense. No, it's not. And you know, I I really think too that the whole intro they didn't really need. I think they should have just started from the matchmaker scene, but that's just me. Yeah, and I I mean I can I can totally understand that because I, I and I don't again I don't mind it. I I think the thing about it is 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 that it it reinforces the frustration that we have with the the movie. Um and it's it's not doing you necessarily any favors uh by being shown and like I think it could have worked if they found a way to kind of rework it and and make it make mm-hmm. more sense. Again, it, if they'd use it as an opportunity to explain chi in a better way, it would have been great, you know. Like, and I think you could yeah. have if you if you wanted to, and they don't. Um. So, and then like we both were saying too, and then not taking it too far to you know, like you were saying, there are things that people can do by, um, you know, training to be extraordinary, but not right. to 
do things that are beyond yeah. human ability. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We can't become hawks through harnessing our chi. <laughs> right, right. Well, and I mean, one of the things that's really interesting, and it's 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 something that I like and I don't like, but we, we have mirrors in this, you know, like Mulan and the witch are mirrors for one another. Uh, and I yeah. like this in some ways because I think it, the strength of it is that it allows us to show different responses to things. You know, both of them are kind of being told, have been told, you know, what they can and can't do and or be. And their responses are very different. Obviously, she's a character who lashes out very selfishly, the witch, and uh, uses her power selfishly um and to get basically what she wants and to hurt other people because she's being told that she can't be who she wants or be who she is and Mulan continues to selflessly serve others through who she is through devotion to family her country and truly learning what you know the ideas of loyalty bravery and truth mean and i i think that that's actually pretty beautiful because I mean, that's a good message. Like, how do you respond to to the to people? How do you respond when you're you're told something like that? Um, do you respond with fear and anger and and frustration and you know lashing out, or do you respond by lovingly winning people over? Like, mm -hmm. I, I think there's a really good message there, and it's actually a good message for our world today because we see that kind of playing out on our own streets. Absolutely. I think that, that that's the main saving thing of this remake is that it's about how people respond to that kind of situation. For sure. I think that you can see that even though the witch doesn't um, fight going that route and lashing out and everything, she does still seem to resist somewhat Bori Khan and, you know, challenging him when he says that she's his slave and things like that. Um, and then ultimately redeeming herself by d jumping in front of the arrow that was aimed at Mulan. So I like that they have that growth with her as a character. Um, and I love the actress Gong Lee, by the way, knew her from Memoirs of a Geisha. Yeah, no, she was great. Um, and I, but I, you you brought something to my mind that I was thinking about, you know, what what does what does the witch do? And that's just her name. And then we don't get another name for her. Mm -hmm. um, she joins the extremists who want to mm -hmm. burn it all down. And yep. Mulan does not do that. You know, her, her right. first reaction is not to burn it all down. Um, Mulan's reaction is to find a way to be who she is in the larger frame of everything. And I think you see two different reactions and one is going to be a way that's going to win people over in the end. You know, it's basically mm -hmm. that thing you get more flies with honey than you do vinegar. Right. And that's exactly the, the, the form that Mulan is taking. And, and I think there's a real beauty to, again, there's a real beauty to that message. Yeah. When I like even that you see that Mulan is tempted a little bit, you know, when she and the witch are face to face and the witch keeps trying to convince her to go her way, you see Mulan kind of hesitate, but then she decides ultimately to stay true. Again, bring up one of those virtues uh, to why she started in the first place. And it's that hero mentality of, you know, I stand for doing the right thing for sticking up for my family and my country and um, you know, looking out for others instead of myself first. Yeah. No, I 100% agree. Uh, and I, I think it's just something that, for me, really stuck out, especially the second time getting to watch the movie and kind of really mm -hmm. trying to pay attention to, um, you know, everything that's being done in it. And, and, and I, that, it's frustrating because, you know, regardless of how the characters and the chi and everything plays out with, with these two, um, the message I felt like was was actually really strong. And I again, I don't mm -hmm. kind of mind the idea of I, it just needed more um, structure, you know, for for the storytelling rules. It really just needed more structure. And I think it would have helped uh, with with that and it made it better. Um, I, I would say too, you know, I, I don't know about if you would agree, but I would say that the one 
other big issue that I have with the movie is is connecting with characters. And I don't feel like this movie did a good job of allowing us to connect with any of the other characters really outside of Mulan. Like, I don't really connect yeah. with her friends, you know, in the army. I feel like we waste Donnie Yen as the, the commander here. Um, there's just nothing that, you know... Th- the training scenes and everything, there's nothing that brings them together as a group, you know, um, and, and makes you feel like they're connected and that they like, and that they would be somebody who would care about liking Mulan as a character and come to her defense later on. Um, it just, it never, it never connects in that way. And that's disappointing because you really need that, especially later in the story when all those people stand up for her and you're like, why, why would they be standing up for her? Why would, you know, like, they barely know each other. Yeah, I think the only character that they give her any kind of connection like that with is uh, Huang Hui. <laughs> it's hard for me to say. <laughs> um, you know, the, the supposed love interest in this version. But I, I think that that is exactly right. Because the thing that makes you so... Um, warm and fuzzy from the animated version is that building of the relationship between her and Ling Yao and Chin Po. And, you know, it takes time through the training and the fighting and things like that, that I assume guys kind of do and then eventually maybe become friends. Um, And they don't do that here. It feels a lot more like Mulan is still in this on her own. Um, And I missed that. And that's my favorite moment, too, from the original movie as well, is when uh, the guys are dressed up as uh, concubines and they have a group hug. (laughs) Yeah. There's no group hug. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and I mean, and part of that is because they they don't um, they don't give you any moment where in the animated movie, they do this so well. Obviously, it's because it's with the song. You know, yeah. um, and and that really helps, I think, in that sense. But you could have done that here where these guys are learning to train together and it's more about them learning to train together. And they do that one moment where she whips out her chi and kicks that guy's butt. Uh, yeah. And it's great. And they all are like, why didn't you tell us? You know, and it's like you needed more moments like that to help them like connect as characters. You know, they have the scene where they're talking about what kind of woman you'd want and but it's like there's not enough of those to really make those actual flesh and blood characters that you kind of care about at all. And the, I, I, I mean, I don't know if it's just because it works better in, in the animation with the song or if I, there's just it, in in all reality, there's something missing from this mm-hmm. when it comes to emotional connection to any of the other characters other than really Mulan herself. And that hurts the rest of the movie. And even, you know, they try to connect her with Donnie Yen's character, the commander, which is fantastic. But Mm -hmm. it, I don't know. Even that feels a little weak. Yeah, it does. Like, you know, and it's not bad. It's just, it. nothing really connects me to this and and maybe it's because and part of this i I don't know if it goes back to the uh, the movie can't quite decide what it wants to be does it want to be a straight up um uh action movie or does it does it want to be um a fantasy movie or somewhere in between and and it's like I don't know. It just can never quite figure that out. And I think that has to uh, do with, you know, why we maybe don't connect so well with the characters because the movie's so worried about looking maybe cool and looking wonderful and all of that. And then um, it misses that we want this to, I mean, we need to care about the characters in the movie other than just mm-hmm. Mulan. Right. Well, and I, and for me, too, and you can tell me if you felt the same or not, but I think it really hurt, too, taking Li Shang out completely as a character and any kind of real romance scene on screen. 
And I was reading on it. And apparently they did that because they were concerned, especially during the time of um, like the Me Too movement beginning and everything. They just felt like the story would be fine without having a romance and that it was um, off putting having a commanding officer have a romance with someone that's subordinate to them. Um, but the way that they handle it in the animated movie, I think worked fine because obviously the entire time they're training and getting to know each other, he thinks she's a man. There is no romance at all. It's just a mutual respect. Well, and the romance is on her part. She's attracted right. to him. He's not attracted yeah. to her. At least that's exactly. how I read it. You know, he's attracted yeah. to the fact that she seems to, to be somebody who's dedicated um, to her to learning to be the man they're trying to train them to be. Right. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I have always so taken I think it that, that way. It, yeah. 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 I think, so I think it hurt them taking that out of this and that that's, if you're afraid that that's the reason that you need to take it out, then you need to examine what you think romance is. <laughs> So, yeah, I think that it would have been a lot stronger, too, with the character development uh, between her and other people. Um, seeing things from Li Shang's perspective, watching her and them train together like you do in the animated movie. Right. Um, and then having that bond. And so then at the end, it would make sense for them to fall in love because he then sees the icing on the cake of a person he already knew he had respect right. and care for so uh, no i 100 percent agree with you it just it doesn't uh, one of the things that this movie maybe shouldn't have done is do a romance at all if they weren't going to do mm-hmm. that you know um because it it does feel like a strange kind of weak romance anyway like it doesn't yeah. feel as strong as is the, the like the the cool thing about the animated version of the romance is that once he realizes that she's a woman, um, all of those things that he um, he respects in her can can turn to love when he also finds that she's a beautiful woman. You know, right. like it 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 takes all of that respect that that's so beautiful, the respect and honor and all that that he he has. Uh, for her and then you know i just yeah it just doesn't work as well yep so So i had to add that no Um, i think you're right and that that is a part of that really not connecting and and um yeah i did like that lies truth and courage though are another really big beautiful part of this film and i really loved her father telling her that you know there's no courage without fear And then we hear in the movie, too, that a lie can only live for so long. And I think there's Mm -hmm. a there's a a really great beauty to both of those themes. Um, And so I'm really glad that this movie talks about that idea of like that. No, you know, there should be fear in doing the right thing. It takes courage like you you can't truly have courage if there's no fear, because then you know, that doesn't take any courage to do anything. Right. Um, then everything's easy. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, and, and that like, it's not worth living in a lie, um, for any length of time because lies can never last. They're always going to be found out and the truth is always going to come out. And I just, I think both of those messages are really cool, especially in the world in which we live where, um, you know, so many people are willing to live a lie uh, for a, as long as they possibly can and fool themselves into thinking they can live in a certain way. Um, and, you know, that we would be so afraid of doing something that we just don't have the courage to step out and do it. You know, like, it, yeah. we, we can't be so afraid that we're not willing to do anything. Like, there's going to be fear in every part of life. Heck, I mean, we don't think about this, but I take my life into my hands every time I drive my car. You know, absolutely. Like, yeah, <laughs> that's just the, the, and that's just the reality of our world. Like we don't think about mm-hmm. it because it's so normal of a thing, but it literally is taking my life into my hands. Like everything in this world is 
<laughs> so much of this world is trying to kill us, right? And we have to have the courage mm-hmm. to step out there and live our lives. And I just, I really love that message. Yeah, I think that you see that in the beginning as well with their juxtaposing Mulan and her sister and saying that, you know, Mulan is basically making that first courageous act by leaving home and not going along with an arranged marriage. Um, and then also showing it again when she's realizing that she can't continue to live a lie of pretending that she's a man in the army and that she has to. It, I like that they say that, you know, that part of her died and she came back to who she really was. Um, and it was interesting too, showing for so long, uh, you know, of a beat that the shard that the witch threw at her to try and kill her got stuck in the binding that she had put to make sure she looked like a man. Yeah. I mean, I think when we think about the idea of, of like living a lie, you know, you, you can't do that for very Mm -hmm. long. It's going to eat you alive. And, and that's kind of what we see. And we did to put, put the death lies and to live the truth and not just, any truth but the real truth like she has to be who she is which she is a woman and like um but then by going back and you know putting herself before uh, her commander and accepting the consequences you know for her actions um but then also willing to still be able to do the right thing you know like she's told never to come back but she comes back because she knows it's the right thing she's the only one who knows this information she's the only one Mm -hmm. who can make sure that they can save uh you know the emperor and again she's putting herself on a line for a system that you know that she should be fighting against which is what our world would tell us and yet she realizes that if she continues to do the right thing people will see her for who she really is and that's the truth wins out right but it's the truth Mm -hmm. of doing the right thing regardless of what the consequences are or how hard it is the courage to do the right thing when it doesn't seem like the right thing to do there's a real awesome beauty in doing that and so i think this Mm -hmm. movie does have some some great thematic elements to it even with some of the frustrations that i've had and I really just I love movies like uh, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon or House of Flying Daggers, you know, just such uh, great films. I love that type of of um, action from with the Asian influence, just the way they do things. I think it's really incredible. And to me, one of the things I remember even seeing the trailers, I was super excited that they were going to use this this style. They were gonna they were gonna take this style because it's so much a part of the you know the influence from Chinese cinema. So I thought it was really smart. And I have to say, this movie looks great. It's it looks phenomenal. Um, they mm-hmm. really well done uh, in the filming style. The the action scenes look amazing. Um, I was really impressed. Um, and it was the thing that the trailers really hooked me with, with being excited to see this movie was that because I thought that it was just, wow, they were pulling it off and they did. Oh, for sure. Like the the cinematography and the stunts and the costuming, I feel like were so rooted in Chinese culture and reflecting like those kind of movies, like you're saying, especially in the stunts, that it it felt larger than life. And that's the thing that captivated me originally in the trailer, too. I remember seeing it in the theater before some other movie and just going, wow. (laughs) So, you know, and especially the um, I love every time, even in the animated one, but especially here, seeing it in live action is cool. The battle scene where the two armies face off for the first time is always yes. so cool to me. Yeah. So yeah, they looked really good. Excellent. And yeah, uh, I think and it, the avalanche and everything that they do. I thought, I mean, all of that mm-hmm. it gets pulled off really well. Yeah. And still making it believable, you know, obviously in the uh, animated version, it's a little more extraordinary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Unbelievable because they, you know, the horse is wading through the waves of snow, like, snow doesn't harm him but here you know they did it in a way that still made sense um and she's still able to save her love interest and uh yeah i i think that too just reflecting as well on like the action scene um i initially was a little put off by the 
army guys running up the wall Mm -hmm. just because of how high you know it is going "Eh, that's also leaning toward the magic element but you know generally like i really like the way that they used it later in the uh fight in like the tunnel Mm -hmm. yeah where they they weren't going too high for human ability (laughs) yeah no i mean i think it just really it, it works for this type of movie and i think again that's the thing like we were talking about beforehand where you know there there's a thing that seems extraordinary and then there's a thing that just seems like magic and the line is very very thin um and you want to make sure you you get that right but i mean what what made this work for me is that i know that this is a you know this is something from chinese cinema you know this is Mm -hmm. a style from chinese cinema so Again, we're we're referencing those type of films, and that doesn't bother me. Be- mm-hmm. And so, when you make it look like something that we've already seen before in cinema history, like a crouching tiger, hidden dragon, it makes complete sense. And I think it works for where we are in the scope of the legend of Mulan and and that kind of thing. So, I mm-hmm. I think it was really cool. Um, and I have to say too, you know, I. I don't mind, you know, I personally loved um, the the job they did with Cinderella, where that's actually my favorite remake of all of the Disney remakes. Um, And I had no problem that they didn't use the music. Um, I loved, though, that they use orchestral versions of the music from the Mulan animated film here because they were such beautiful songs, especially Reflection, and they work so beautifully with an orchestral sound to them. And I thought that was great. I think the music here was really well done. And, and um, Gregson Williams is, does a great job of, of giving us um, uh, uh, that, that perfect blend of the action set pieces and the beauty of these themes and working them all together. I thought it was really well done. I definitely agree there as well. I think that, it always is going to be a little bit difficult for me with any of the live action remakes because the music of the animated films is so tied to me growing up, as I'm sure a lot of people. But I'm glad that they do at least keep it in in that way, in paying homage to it and hearing those themes still playing in you know the appropriate scenes, even though we're not getting a sing along version. So yeah, I, I think it was especially beautiful when they're playing the music during. Mulan getting ready to see the matchmaker. Um, And then even where they've changed some things, it was nice, uh, especially in the scenes where she's apologizing to or trying to bond with her father. Um, Mm -hmm. I think that the combination of that and the actors was so moving, especially in those scenes. So yeah, I I loved the music too. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's good stuff and it's just a well done score, I think. Um, and it's 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 what you want in the sense of to to pay uh, homage to to what's come before, and, and one of the reasons that we're making this in the first place because it it comes from you know what we've seen, um, and I think um, Gregson Williams is he's just a I I like him as a composer. He's done some great stuff out there. Obviously, he did uh, Wonder Woman, uh, you know, and he's he did uh, the Chronicles of Narnia and stuff like that. So it's it's good stuff. Um, well, I'm really interested just as we've kind of talked through the movie, um, where you kind of come down then uh, as, you know, a rating for Mulan. So ultimately, all things considered, I still would give this version of Mulan a two and a half out of five stars because it, it to me it strays too far from the story of the original, even though I know it's supposed to kind of be considered its own thing and not a shot for shot remake of the animated version. It just these things of not fully explaining the chi, adding the magical element and cutting some of the big characters like Li Shang to me really hurt the story and the ability to connect with it more. Um, and then to changing the names, for example, of instead of Shan Yu, it's Bori Khan. And instead of the Huns, it's the Roran army, I think kind of disconnected me from it as well. So, uh, yeah, I it's OK, but I don't feel like rushing to rewatch it. 
Yeah, I, I think this is it's interesting. It was interesting rewatching it and kind of drilling down, I think, the, the things that, that didn't sit well with me and into why that was the case. And I really think the biggest thing about this is that, as we talked about, the if you want to have this be uh, a fantasy feel, that's fine. I have no problem with that. So do it, you know. Um, but just give us enough in the movie to help it make sense. And mm-hmm. honestly, in the end, I think what it does is it just hurts the story. What I think would have just worked better here um, is to have a uh, a remake that, that doesn't have music, it doesn't have Mushu in it, um, but that allows this to be a more serious, like realistic take on the idea of Mulan. I think that's a fantastic mm-hmm. way to go. And at the same time, in doing that, um, you know, you could have some of the more fantastical fighting elements that you get in, uh, like the Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon style, which would make sense. Um, but it's, yeah, it's just something where I feel like they've they lost, they lost themselves in this. They're trying to do too much, and mm-hmm. they kind of, that what they do... <laughs> Reminds me of this great quote from from Scotty in, in Star Trek Three. He's like, "the the more they overwork the plumbing, the easier it is to stop up the drain." And I right. think they took a a simply perfect story, and they made it too complicated for its own good. And honestly, I think that's what happens with many of these remakes: is they're they they're overworking what was already perfect. Um. Yep. And and. I, in all honesty, I just I just say they sh- we don't need these remakes. We don't need them, you know. And mm-hmm. um, I think they can, are continuing to prove that for me. Um, maybe this is a little bit better than some of the others that I've seen, but on a whole, I mean, it's still just barely eking out a three out of five for me. Um, mm-hmm. It's on another day, it could be two point five out of five. And that's disappointing because I was really looking forward to this Um, when I saw the trailers. I thought it was looking amazing. The trailers were making it look fantastic. And then it just, it didn't work. So, yeah, um, that's just kind of where I ended up with this one. But I'm excited to see what maybe you have for us as a recommendation tonight, Christy. Yeah, so I thought about it, and uh, sometimes now I'm, I, it helps me to find something related to one of the actors and what we've been talking about uh, on the c- current show. But I uh, saw something a little while back with my husband, um, because he saw it, I think, on Netflix. Um, but I'm going to recommend Ip Man, which is a 2008 Donnie Yen movie. Speaking of Donnie Yen. Uh, and actually, it is... Um, a fictional story based on the real story of a guy named Ip Man who trained Bruce Lee. So it's based on his real life of practicing the art of Wing Chun and since kind of brought that style back into people practicing it again. Um, And I think there were even like three or four sequels to Ip Man. So uh, and actually, Donnie Yen is playing the role of Ip Man in the movies. So I highly recommend checking that out. Nice. Nice. Uh, well, I'm going to recommend uh, a couple of things here. Uh, and in the sense that I'm going to recommend the book and the movie. I just read Hillbilly Elegy. Uh, and I watched the movie that's on Netflix. And I really liked both. Um, I think they're uh, really important. Um, the book is phenomenal and I think it helps explain a segment of society to which most people are not familiar with, which is the working class of America and especially areas that have been really run down and to, to why and the, the how of these people. Um, I think JD Vance does a fantastic job of just sharing his story and allowing us to live that life with him. Uh, he doesn't make any excuses for anyone in in the story. It, it, he just tells it like he remembers it growing up, and I think it's really, uh, it's really important. And I really liked the movie. I thought that Glenn Close was fantastic in it, uh, and I thought Amy Adams was as well. 
And it is, I mean, it was a moving story for me to watch. You know, it, it's hard to watch people be in these positions and, and see them make those choices. But I also think it's important for us to be able to see those things too. So um, it's on Netflix uh, and the book was fantastic. So I highly recommend both. Nice. Well, Christy, then if uh, anybody wants to catch up with you and see what you've got going on uh, before we hit our next show, where can they find you? You can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Bespin Bell. I still need to create that Letterboxd account. Maybe I'll do that tonight. Uh, and then when I'm not here on 602 Club, I do a show uh, called Sabres and Spells on the Skywalking Through Neverland Network Skynet. And uh, we're having a little bit of a change in show format. So I hope you'll stay tuned for our next episode coming out in the next week or so uh, to see what new news we've got. Awesome. Uh, and you can find me all over social media under Matt Rushing 2 If I'm on that platform, that's what I'll be. Uh, you can also find me here on the network uh, doing literary tracks as well as the orb. Um, I'm doing both of those with Chris Jones. Literary tracks is all about the books and the comics of Star Trek. And then, of course, um, the orb is about Star Trek Deep Space Nine. And then over on the Nerd Party Network doing two shows. One is called Owlpost, doing that with Drea Kaufman as we are walking one chapter at a time through Harry Potter. And then doing, and then of course I've got Aggressive Negotiations, doing that with John Mills. It's a Star Wars podcast and every week we're diving into something we've been thinking about there in the wars and it's a blast. So I hope you'll check it out. But thank you so much for joining us. And say that to my face, you limp noodle. Thank you.